Today, I'm delighted to be joining Greg Dickerson, the Managing Director of LN Asia Pacific, as part of our legal talk series to discuss the opportunities and also the risks presented by emerging technologies such as generative AI in more detail. It's fair to say few topics have generated quite so much interest in the legal profession in recent months as generative AI, and in particular, OpenAI's ChatGPT. We've seen a meteoric increase in the number of users of ChatGPT, which reflects interest from the market. It reached the unprecedented milestone of over 100 million users in a little over two months, making it the fastest growing consumer software application ever. In the legal industry, we've seen a stream of headlines questioning whether ChatGPT will make lawyers obsolete. Spoiler alert, but we can discuss it later, Greg, but I certainly don't think it's going to. No, it's not. <laughs> but also exploring the opportunities um, for the industry, as well as identifying a range of important issues that we all need to keep in mind and understand in more details. As governments try to catch up with this fast-moving technology, we're also likely to see new regulations and legislation emerge in the coming months. In the meantime, there's been much discussion about issues, particularly things like IP, which is pushing our traditional understanding of that area. Now, Greg, I know in the past we've previously spoken about the adoption of technology in the legal industry more generally. Since we had that last conversation, obviously generative AI and interest in it from our legal market has particularly taken off. So today I'd really like to focus on talking to you a little bit more about generative AI specifically and looking in particular at some of the opportunities maybe that our customers are considering, as well as some of the important issues that they might need to keep in mind when they're looking at this type of technology. So to kick us off, I'm really interested to sort of hear your thoughts on the amount of hype that we're seeing, um, not just generally, but particularly in the legal industry at the moment. What do you think it is particularly around this innovation that's caused quite so much hype? Lindsay, I think it's, um, it, it's, it is phenomenal when you talk about 200 million users as quickly as mm. that. And that remember, they're also limiting users now. So I was speaking to yeah. some people the other day and they can't get on. So they're actually limiting that uptake and that uptake has been so, so fast. What do I think? I think it's the step change in the machine's ability to understand us. Mm -hmm. And that has been, they talk, they talk about at some point when you get big enough models that have been trained on enough data that you get a step change in what they do. Um, and that step change is like a, a discontinuous. They almost call it emergent intelligence. And I think that's what's happened. But it reminds me of the other times I've seen step changes in my technology career. And those were the first time I ever touched Google. I'd been using, now this is for the older generation amongst our audience, but I'd been using AltaVista in the 90s. Very hard to use. You get millions of search results. You had to go page by page by page until you found the one you wanted. Google came along and almost immediately, the very first was the one you wanted. And as a result, people did not go back. And I see that has happened with Google. It's happened with, to me, Netflix changed my, my TV behavior almost instantly. It happened with, uh, with, um, with my phones, with, you know, with um, smartphones, and it's going to happen with ChatGPT. And why? Because I think you've suddenly got something that understands you. Before you didn't have that. And now it is like talking to a human. And it is like getting responses which are fluent and understandable. They might not be right but they make you feel good. It feels like you're actually getting, a, you're talking to something that's that's sentient. And I'm putting that in inverted commas. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that makes sense, Greg. And certainly for anybody who's interacted in any way with these kinds of tools, you notice that immediately, the way in which it's responding and interacts with you is completely different to any kind of technology we've seen before. So it, it might be a bit of a difficult question to, maybe to ask at the outset of our chat today, but do you think the interest that we're seeing from the market is justified at this point in time? I think it is. I think the hype has definitely gone gone through the stratosphere and you've got we're with a very, very fast hype cycle. Uh, and the question is, will we hit that trough, trough of disillusionment mm -hmm. very soon? And we may do because most people who have played with it will see that it hallucinates. It comes up with facts that 
don't exist. They're like your drunk friend in the pub, yeah. very, very opinionated, but um, not, not always right. But I do actually think the hype is justified. And when you read a little bit more about the technology underlying it and how these men models are, cha- are, are have been trained, you recognize that they, they get, and I talked about it a bit earlier, you get to the discontinuity point where you've given it enough data and you've built a big enough model and you've spent enough money on it that it actually now does something different. It's actually creative. It's not just the same as it was, just more just faster and slightly more knowledgeable. There is a step change. And that's, I think, what ChatGPT is showing, showing us. And there are other large language models out there that are similar. That step change is a result of just enough data. And it's almost like I think you see with a young child, because these are not that dissimilar to the way we learn. These are neural networks that are trained. And we're a neural network fundamentally, you know, in our brains. And we wire ourselves up when we're children. And I think as a parent, you'll see your child suddenly does go through these phases where they're learning, 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 and you don't see much change. And then suddenly they're, they're fluent. They can talk. You know, the sentences are getting sprung together and everything else. And to some extent, those two analogies are pretty close. The way we learn, learn a lot, and then suddenly you become competent. It's almost like that's what we're seeing. Yeah. And it's a long way to go, feels though. feels like what's happened. In, yeah. Indeed. Yes. But I feel like, you know, those of us with an interest in tech have sort of been aware of large language models there in the background for a while now. You know, what I think some people perhaps don't realize is they've been around for a few years already, but it certainly feels like it's really in recent months that that step change has actually been achieved. So it's interesting to hear you describe that because I think, like you say, we're right on the edge of that big leap forward that we've taken, which is really starting to generate that hype. Yeah. No, I suppose and just to do a quick things. plug on my products before you jump through, <laughs> we have been working with this since 2018. We've been working on large language models, um, you know, from some from Google and from some of the earlier versions of ChatGPT, you know, GPT-3 and that. And some of our products have been built around that. Um, so we're lucky. We are very excited about this, but we also understand the, the strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things which is really interesting is it's, it's for me, it's seeing kind of the rest of the market almost catch up with what we've been yeah. talking about internally for some time now and you know that kind of sudden interest in artificial intelligence and particularly generative AI is you know where we've been heading internally for a long period of time so it's really great to kind of see that the market suddenly is at that point as well where we can start to talk about that a little bit more which um, I know you're also very excited about uh, as am I. But I mean, I think one of the things that's been most interesting for me in amongst the sort of hype around um, generative AI has been quite how quickly the legal industry seems to have really grasped the fact that there are big opportunities here. Um, I think perhaps in the past with some of the big step changes you've described, we've perhaps seen in the past that the legal industry has maybe been a little bit more conservative about exploring some of these sort of new trends. But it feels like with generative AI, there's some really solid user cases there that law firms are exploring and really being quite proactive in seeking out those opportunities. So I'm really interested to hear what you think, and I know our listeners will be as well, some of those big opportunities for law firms. Where do you think they lie in the sort of realm of generative AI and how that might be used by those firms? Yeah, absolutely. And and, and why do I think uh, legal has jumped on this more than previous you know, mm-hmm. new tech that's come out? I think fundamentally this is about language. And the law is centered on language. And, and that's why we can very quickly, when we look at it, understand that this actually does impact what we do as lawyers in different ways. And uh, and so, therefore, it's easier to take this and think about what's it going to do in my in my day job. And so, as you were saying, there's, there's a number there. Um, first up, there's the process efficiencies. You know, we do a lot of work. We I'm, I'm putting myself in, in, the, in the bucket of, of lots of other lawyers, and I'm not a lawyer, but I'm, I'm, I feel like I am, having worked for, <laughs> as I have at LexisNexis and understanding what lawyers do. And the first one is process efficiencies, right? And that is looking at, you know, what are the things that we do with language that we can do more effectively because a large language model is helping us. Um, so things like document analysis, how do I review a document, understand a document, how do I create a document, how do I draft a document? Both of those can be helped by a large language model, which can understand a document and help me uh, understand bits of it and pull out facts. And drafting can create initial drafts, can change wording, can change potentially the, the style in which a document's been written. 
So that's pretty cool. Um, then that also extends to things like research and knowledge management, which is very, very close, obviously, to our heart. Mm-hmm. When you look at things like research, um, you're getting a lot of content back when you search for cases, for example, or legislation or secondary content. And how do you digest that fast and effectively? And as we all know, lawyers are time, time poor. And, and it's, it's a tough, that's a tough job of how do I understand enough that I can help my client, but not over service to the point that I actually, you know, I, I need to earn a living. I need to, to, to help more clients. And I think Roger as well will help there a lot at helping that research journey, summarizing, et cetera. And then even the standard stuff like standard client communication, right? So if I'm going to send out, uh, you know, a standard letter or even like a, uh, you know, anything that I'm going to send out to a customer quickly, those are the things that potentially we can get quite quickly out of um, ChatGPT or another language, a large language model like that, because they're very good at creating communications. You can read through it quickly, and your role goes from the creator to the reviewer. Mm-hmm. And I think that's pretty that's pretty cool. And if you think about the journey, I think in in law firms, you start off as creators and then you eventually become more reviewers and you're able to think more highly and you've got more junior lawyers doing the doing the research and the creation and you then doing the reviewing. And this is helping everybody become a bit more of a reviewer and a little bit less of that initial creator, you know, the, the grunt work creating, if you like. It's still requiring lawyers though, and I think this is really important, still requiring lawyers though to use their legal knowledge and and use their real understanding of the law. Chat GPT or any other large language one is not going to take that away from you. But what it's going to give you is that that huge process efficiency underneath. Um, so that's some of it. Um, obviously, then you get the things like improvement in communication. There is a great um, TED talk uh, with with Greg, the founder of of OpenAI, where he talks about working ChatGPT in with things like Dali, which is another one of their models that, that creates yeah. images. And it's an awesome thing because there, not only does he create the the, the content, he asks him, he asks ChatGPT to come up with a, a a menu, but then says, "Lay me the table and show me the picture," and it then goes and creates a picture of the menu that you're gonna that you're gonna cook. So you can almost create something. So you can start to see that it's not only generating language, which you can generate other things. So that's what I love is that that you can choose different ways in which you can communicate with your clients as well. And we're going to see that. And of course, part of communication is marketing. So um, once you've once you've been able to do that, what's great about things like, like ChatGPT is you can take all this briefing, all this heavy legal stuff that you've done, and you can say, how do I turn this into a marketing communication? And you know, lawyers, we also need to market. We also need to get new clients. So uh, I think there's a lot when it comes to both digesting, summarizing um, inbound information, but then also creating external content that can be used in um in in how you 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 interact and, and interface with your with your clients yeah and i think that makes a lot of sense because it's certainly if you talk to our customers and others within the legal industry you'd be hard pushed to find somebody who doesn't want to have more time in their day um as you say they are incredibly time poor and what you've just been discussing there are really a lot of user cases around actually saving that time up front a lot of that basic first stage work so that we're really looking at utilizing you know lawyers expertise where it matters most further along in that journey to review and amend and really add value where it's needed rather than at that really early stage. So I think it makes a lot of sense as to why there's been quite so much interest given, you know, given those possibilities. And, and just a little caveat though, when we think about these are all great, but I think the big concern that a lot of lawyers have have is, okay, I can get ChatGPT or a large language model to do these things for me, but how do I know that it's accurate and how do I know it's it's it's, it's actually giving me or not making up facts? Um, and I know we'll probably talk about it a bit later, but I just want to intersperse. Yeah, that's where we from Nexus Nexus have spent a lot of effort because we create a lot of content that we we see a huge opportunity here for us as a business, and we're working heavily on it to provide you with certain certainty around the fluency that you get from the model. Yeah, I agree. It feels like we're still at that point where there needs to be almost a middleman, right? Between it, you know, sort of in some ways filtering, assessing, ensuring that what's actually produced is going through that really robust accuracy checking process before it kind of lands in the hands of lawyers to sort of take that output and do something with it, particularly where that often ends up being client facing. And, you know, there can obviously be significant risks there. So, yeah, I I definitely want to talk to you about that because I think there's some major opportunities um, in that area. 
I mean, I know I've heard about a few sort of firms who've got some um, specific ideas around how they might adopt generative AI and what the opportunities um, in that area are. Have you heard, Greg, of any firms in particular who are doing anything interesting in this space already? Yep. So um, I've heard of Ellen Overy. They partnered with a startup back GPT uh, creator, right? Um, which introduced a chatbot. So I think that's an easy and uh, mm-hmm. a nice way to get in because a chatbot doesn't have to be accurate, but it can make your interface with a customer so much more effective or the client so much more effective. Um, and that's a tool. Um, have you probably heard of the tool named Harvey? And they rolled it out across the entire network, um, which obviously helps them um, with that inbound, but also helps them enhance, enhance tasks like contract analysis, due diligence, and, you know, looking at regulatory compliance. Um, so that's interesting. Um, so that, that's one as an example. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a perfect example as well of what you were talking about previously about the potential user cases, right? It's that first yeah. stage in the process. How do we speed that up and then add in the value of our expert lawyers at a later stage? So it will definitely be interesting to see how that goes. And I'm sure we're going to see, you know, many more examples like that come out in the next sort of weeks and months, which will be interesting to see. So you introduced the topic a few minutes ago um, very nicely, Greg. I think it's really hard to talk about generative AI without at this stage also having a discussion about the limitations and the risks. I think for a lot of um, our customers and our listeners who are at that stage of being interested, but maybe a bit nervous about the technology at this stage, it's probably something important for them to keep in mind up front. Because I think having an awareness of those sort of risks and limitations can help determine what user cases they look at or how they kind of fit generative AI and technology more generally into their processes, you know, whether they need to make adaptations internally in order to really embrace these kinds of um, technologies. So, I know that there's a number of risks and limitations that have been discussed. You sort of mentioned a couple of them earlier. I know one of the big ones that people are concerned about is around AI hallucination. Um, I mean, statistics on this seem to vary, but I know I was reading something the other day that suggested that certainly with chat GPT, that hallucination rate could be between 15 and 20 percent even, which is, you know, certainly high enough to be a concern if you're sort of taking those outputs and looking to do something with it. Um, As you know, I've been uh, very interested to play around with some of these tools in the past couple of months, and I've certainly had firsthand experience of it entirely making (laughs) up case law, which was um, quite interesting. I I challenged myself to track down on all of our global systems to see if I could find the case, and it did not exist. (laughs) It was quite interesting. (laughs) Are there any other sort of risks and limitations in that area that you think people should be particularly aware of? Yeah, and I think it's very valid that you bring up hallucinations, mm-hmm. and and obviously that's where people go. But I think if you look particularly at ChatGPT to start with, but then we can go more wider. Um, some of it's limited to currency. Mm-hmm. When was it? As you may know, ChatGPT finished I think end of twenty one, so we've got a year and a half or so of data that's not in there. So when you ask it questions that are more on more current affairs, you don't get answers because it just doesn't know. Um, and part of the currency as well is, and I don't know this well enough, but I, do we actually know how time relevant things are? So if you think from a legal perspective, things that happen more recently are more important. And it's not clear that that models have, have that time relevancy. They don't necessarily wait more recency versus older recency. So that's some, that's another thing to consider. Right? consider. And obviously that really goes then to the wider is how, how much data and what data are these models trained on. They generally train on very large data sets, but they're often generalized data sets. They're not necessarily accurate either. And they don't, for example, um, incorporate the the data that we have as an example, um, the kind of data that we have that's behind paywalls and firewalls, etc. And it's the same with any of of the other large data providers. Um, The models don't have access to that. Um, The other concerns I would have if I was looking at it from a pure external perspective when I was working with it is uploading content. Uh, the standard terms and conditions at the moment, ChatGPT in particular, is actually uh, able to use that content in multiple ways, um, using it to train the model. So you need to understand exactly what you're doing with that and making sure that you've got the right T's and C's in place um, and that you actually have the right um, confidentiality around uh, how your, your data is going to be used. Um, we've talked, of course, about accuracy. Um, and then, of course, is there an accuracy gap there, right? So um, the factual accuracy rate, which we understand to be about 70 
70 to 80 percent on the subject matter, depending on the subject matter. It's particularly for law. Um, but the problem is that we often assume accuracy and fluency are the same thing. It's a natural human bias. Uh, and, uh, you know, you walk into a room and somebody's fluent and articulate, you tend to believe them more than somebody who isn't. And so just be aware that these models are better at fluency than they are at accuracy and is making sure that. And that is why often when you do interact with the models, your first question may not get it right, but prompting the slightly different angles and giving an input document, you get a far better response. And that's why sometimes it shouldn't be called chat GPT. Maybe it could be called prompt GPT. The more you prompt it, the better the answer you get. And that's something we're learning as we work with these large language models from our internal perspective is potentially prompting and guiding it with the data we have gives you far better outcomes and outputs. So the way you work with it is also important. Um, and then, of course, there's the IP issues, that, that, that data that's been created, that content that's been created, who owns it, um, what can you do with it. Uh, if, you, for example, it's helped you write a paper, you know, do you cite it? So there's a whole number of questions there. And then, of course, the big question that we always have with AI systems is what is the inherent bias? There's often inherent bias in the content we put in. It may not be something we've, we're conscious about, and almost always it's not. But the data that we put in often creates bias. And so you need to be aware of that as well, especially with if you're using that content for how you communicate externally. So there's a number of, of, of risks there that I think uh, we all need to be aware of. And I think, Greg, what that does is it shows that practically there's a few sort of steps there that, you know, people can take if they're looking at ways to adopt this technology. You know, it certainly seems to me that um, a lot of firms are going to need to look at implementing some, you know, policies around what exactly are some of the outputs of AI, such as, you know, if they're using chat GPT, what the kind of accuracy checking process that people are going through within a firm when they're looking to use these things are, and also having really robust policies around that kind of IP um, for people internally too. So, you know, I think there's some good practical steps that um, they can take there. Now, obviously, we ourselves have been, you know, playing in this space for some time. And, you know, I know that we will have um, some exciting things to come in the future, sort of um, watch this space uh, for people there. But I guess at this point, what I'd really like to ask you is, Maybe let's get the crystal ball out and I promise that I won't sort of check back in a few months and see if we've been right or wrong on any of this. But what do you think we're going to see over the next maybe six months to a year, particularly in the legal industry around sort of adoption of generative AI in this space? Do you think that we're going to see this sort of reality of how this can really help people live up to the sort of current hype that we're talking about in the market? Lindsay, I think we're probably going to go through a rapid mm -hmm. hype cycle. If you remember, you get to the top and then you get the yeah. trough of disillusionment. And I would caution all our listeners to get through that trough of disillusionment. I think you will see good technology come out quickly. But what you're probably going to see in the very short term is a lot of small startups that are going to use this for quick point solutions that are probably going to disappoint. And that's because there's so many people jumping on this. What you're then going to see very soon thereafter is companies like us who are going to create solutions that we've worked very closely with lots of customers who understand their needs, and we've used our both our technology but our content strength to create solutions that are far more robust and actually meet customers' use, um, use cases and needs, as you were saying. And I think that's very much going to be across the gamut of the whole research journey and the drafting journey and the, the creation of content, the communication with them. Um, with customers and with your clients. I think there's going to be cases around that, understanding briefs, um, working in um, from a litigation perspective. I think it's going to hit on everywhere in which we need to understand, synthesize, uh, and create data and uh, create content. And I think that's going to be, you know, that's a lot of what a lawyer does. Um, and that's what I think we're going to see. Longer term, putting on the real crystal ball, yeah? <laughs> I, 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 I'm challenged to think, is this the start of the journey towards generalized intelligence mm. um, or not? Uh, ChatGPT, for example, I was told, can sum up two, 3,000 digit numbers. It was never tr taught how to do that, but add up two, 3,000 digit numbers. But it can't add up a 3,000 digit number and a 2,500 digit number. It doesn't know how to do that. So it's almost like a child that's learning. Yeah. Um, but ways in which, why does a language model know how to work with maths? But if you ever do work with it and play with it with maths and ask it to solve problems for you and explain it, it does it pretty well. So for me, I'm thinking, 
there is potentially something highly creative here, which could mm-hmm. could absolutely change the way we interact with technology, not just in how we process a few legal documents, but in a wider sense. And that excites me as well. Yeah, no, it's it's certainly exciting times, but it certainly sounds like for the moment, our kind of key advice to people is that, you know, if this is something you're interested in, really innovation works best when you're trying to solve a particular problem, right? When you have a user case in mind, you know, technology might be the solution to that, but technology by itself isn't going to solve all of your issues unless you have a particular pain point or a particular problem that you're trying to address. That's exactly right. Start start with the pain point, start with the need, and then work backwards towards the technology. And a little bit of advice for the law firms who've been laggards up until now, you need to get your content in the right form. Mm -hmm. If If your content's dispersed everywhere, it's going to be so much harder to work with new technologies. So that 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 hygiene factor of getting your content sorted out, um, getting your users working with uh, research platforms like us and working with their content in a good way, those things need to happen because these capabilities will come fast and they are not going to disrupt your law firm. What's going to happen is law firms that are using them more effectively are going to be far better competitors, and that's going to be a that's 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 the challenge. Yeah. Some great advice there, I think. Well, Greg, it's been very interesting talking to you today. I am particularly looking forward to when we catch up next time and seeing what's been happening with these technologies and anything else that comes out in that point in time. It's always awesome to talk to you, Lindsay. Thank you so much. 